how, seeing how the kids come out here and enjoy it. I thought long and hard about what type of message I wanted to give since this is going to be the last time, and I realized that this is going to be the last time that I see many of you. And my fear is that the Bible says that many of you are going to come to Christ on the day of judgment, and he's going to say, depart, me for, depart from me, for I never knew you. And that means the wrath of God will be poured out on some of you. So that's my fear. This is my last plea to you uh, to, uh, to, to listen to this and to repent. So there's a historical story in 2 Kings 5 about a man named Naaman. He was a high-profile captain in the Aram army, and he had a skin disease called leprosy. Now, it's a very serious disease and usually quarantined individuals. So he sought out a cure in Israel, and eventually he was led to the prophet Elisha. Elisha told him to go to the Jordan River and wash himself seven times. And on that seventh time, his skin would be cleansed. Okay, this infuriated, uh, infuriated Naaman because the Jordan River was associated with the lower class Israelites. He wanted to go to the better rivers, so he left in rage. But then his servants reasoned with him and said if, if the prophet had uh, told him to do something noble, he would have done it. Okay, so eventually he humbled himself and went into the Jordan River, and on that seventh time, his skin was made like a child. It was, it was cleansed. Now, the question is, what does that have to do with us? Well, you see, you are Naaman, and I'm Elisha, okay? And we all have this disease called sin, which is far worse than leprosy, okay? And we need to be cured of that. And you might think, well, I'm a religious person. I go to church. I pray. I, you know, I do all these things. I believe in God. But, my friend, if you're trying to do that to save yourself, you're going to a different river, and you're not going to be saved. You're not going to be cleansed. For religion in itself saves no one. Okay? The Bible says that we all must go through the narrow gate. And that narrow gate is repentance. And if we go through any other gate, then we are going on the wrong path, which leads to an eternity in hell. Okay? And until you realize your sin and your crimes against God, you're on that broad path to destruction. And see, my life was made up of many parts. I had the sports part, I had the work part, I had the family part, and oh yeah, over here I had this little religion part. And I thought that if I had this religion part, and I, I would be just fine, you know, no big deal. But then, a, uh, well, also, a, uh, I even prayed to God, that's right. You know, I prayed to God, I went to confession as a child even. Oh yeah, I was confirmed as a Catholic, and oh yeah, I was baptized twice in two different religions. And you know what? None of those works ever saved me. For Isaiah 64, 6 says that, For all of us have become like one who is unclean, and all our righteous deeds are like a filthy garment. You see, I was prideful like Naaman. I didn't believe I was a sinner to the core. I didn't believe I was lost. And I thought I had it all figured out. That was until God revealed my sin to me, and my burden became so real that I literally wept over my sin. Now, the world will tell you not to feel like that, but to cheer up. But, my friend, that is exactly what leads to genuine repentance, according to the Bible. Okay? So, I had to look beyond myself for the remedy. Because I stood condemned before a holy and righteous God. And I couldn't save myself. And, you see, God's, uh, according to the Bible, God says that the just penalty for sin is death. And without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sins. So I needed a divine intervention. And that's when Christ called me to him. And he showed me that he was God in the flesh and that he paid for my sins. And that it literally became so personal to me for the first time, I became saved. And that's what it's about. <sighs> Most professing Christians lack that true repentance, that true brokenness, and they're void of that urgent desperation. And they, they don't want a gospel that calls for that type of repentance, that self-denial and bowing down to the Lord Jesus Christ. They want a gospel where they can just hang around Jesus like a buddy. They want a gospel that fixes their life now and gives them that best life now. But I'm here to proclaim to you that is not the gospel and that is not what Jesus Christ died for. And we, we need to take this seriously. You must be born again, John 3, 3. How do you do that? Well, if you hear God telling you right now that you need to come in repentance of faith, come. You get low before God. You, you get, tell Him that you're sorry. You tell Him that you're done justifying yourself. And you 
you confess your sins before him. It's a uh, it's the best analogy I got here. Well, I'm going to skip that one. 2 Corinthians 5.17 says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. You see, Christ is that living river, that river of living water. Now, ask yourself this. If you're saved, ask yourself this question. Do I share Christ with anybody? If you had your, a friend of yours step in front of you and take a bullet for you, and he died, you would be proclaiming what that person did for you wherever you went. If you truly believe that Jesus Christ took your spot on that cross and died for you, why do you not share your faith? We all should be sharing our faith. If you truly believe that he took your spot on the cross, then you should be sharing your faith. There's no question about it. Now, I'll give you one last analogy. We all proclaim to have this impact with the creator of the universe, right? But we show no effect of it. Many of us don't show that effect. That's like me telling you that I was standing on the highway and a Mack truck just hit me head on. But you call me a liar, right? Because I'm standing right here. See, 1 John 1, 1.6 says, if we say we have fellowship with him while we walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. If we are a Christian, we are a new creation, we are born from above, and no longer walk away according to the ways of this world. And I'm going to leave you with this, 1 Corinthians 6, 9 through 10. Or do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor homosexuals, nor thieves, nor the covetous, nor drunkards, nor revelers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. Ask yourself if you're on that list. And if you are, do what Isaiah 45, 22 says, turn to him and be saved. Come in repentance and faith. Make sure you do that. And that's all I have to say. This is done out of love, pure compassion, and I pray that you've heard these words today. And uh, I thank you for letting me share this message. I'd like to close in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you for this time. I pray that you open the eyes, open the ears, that uh, people will see and hear you that they come in repentance and faith, Father. I pray that you enable us as parents not only to bring our children to these godly events, but also to share the gospel with them and to help guide them to you, Father. And that's what it's all about, is living out the gospel. And I feel so privileged to be able to share that today. And I thank you for that in Jesus' name.